Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to our service of worship this morning at the First Congregational Church of Boylston, as well as those are watching on television or on the internet. Our service is also on WBAC local cable at 2 p.m. My name is Christy Stilla, and I am the worship leader today. Our organist is Charles Nuachuku, and our minister is Pastor George Cole. Welcome. Um, I want to tell you about the flowers on the altar today. The flowers on the altar today are given to the glory of God for all the wonderful mothers by Diane Hersey. Thank you. And the flowers being handed out this morning to everyone here in all the women in the uh, church today are in recognition of all the women in the church. So happy Mother's Day from John and Linda at Flowerland. If you have, a, if you have uh, a wish to communicate with our church, we would love to hear from you. If you need uh, a prayer request or um, any help at all, um, please call our number. This is our, this is our phone number, 508-869-2027. And um, please let us know if we can help you. Remember to send in your pledges by mail if you have not um, feel comfortable coming yet back into our church. We still need your uh, continued support to meet our expenses, of course. We have a few announcements um, in your bulletin. Um, I want you to take a look of um, the wonderful work that the youth group is going to be doing. They would love your help with the next service project. Um, Basically, they're going to be helping out the Worcester community fridges and collecting food. Um, there's a lot of details in the bulletin. Um, you can drop off stuff here at the church. Um, so please look in your bulletin for further uh, details on that. And the other announcement that I have is that um, the Ladies Benevolent Society, LBS, will be inviting all women to come this Thursday, 10 to 12, meeting outside the church. Um, probably in the parking lot, to join in fellowship. Pastor Cole? Yes, I just want to wish a happy Mother's Day to uh, all of the mothers present among us. Uh, there was a, a husband that came home from work one day, and uh, the kids were running around in the backyard in their pajamas and in the mud, and, uh, and uh, there were, you know, like bicycles and all kinds of things strewn all over the place, and it got no better when he walked inside the door um, there were toys all over the place. There was a lamp that was tipped. There was a piece of toast laying downside uh, on, the, on the carpet and so forth. And, uh, uh, and he said to his wife, what in the world happened today? And she goes, well, you know how so often when you come home from work, you wonder what in the world I did all day? Well, today I didn't do it. And just to extend our celebration of mothers, uh, we'll have a, a cup of coffee out in the parking lot for you following the service today. So we've got a beautiful day. Hopefully you can join us. Welcome all. Please join me um, with our call to worship. Stand if you are able as we read together. Um, I'm the leader. You're the people. Got it? All right. We gather to worship our loving, nurturing God, who, like a mother, knows us intimately. Who loves us unconditionally. Who teaches us the way we should go. And who comforts us in times of need. Praise be to God, the source and sustainer of life. Um, let's also uh, continue worshiping together with our responsive Mother's Day prayer that's in the bulletin. Lord, on this day, set aside to honor and remember mothers. We give you thanks for our mothers. We are grateful that you chose to give us life through them and that they received the gift of life from your hands and gave it to us. Thank you for the sacrifices that made, they made in carrying us and giving us birth. We thank you for the women who raised us, who held us and fed us, who cared for us and kissed away our pain. We pray that our lives may reflect the love that they showed us and that they would be pleased to call, be called our moms. We pray that older moms whose children are grown grant them joy and satisfaction for a job well done. We pray for new moms experiencing changes they could not predict. 
Grant them rest and peace as they trust you for the future. We pray for pregnant women who will soon be moms. Grant them patience and good counsel in the coming months. We pray for moms who face the demands of single parenthood. Grant them strength and wisdom. We pray for moms who are raising their children in poverty. Grant them relief and justice. We pray for stepmothers. Grant them patience and understanding and love. We pray for moms who are separated from their children. Grant them faith and hope. We pray for moms in marriages that are in crisis. Grant them support and insight. We pray for moms who have lost children. Grant them comfort. We pray for moms who gave up their children for adoption. Grant them peace and confidence as they trust in your providence. We pray for our adopted mothers. Grant them joy and gratitude for the gift you have provided. We pray for women who desperately want or wanted to be moms. Grant them grace to accept your timing and will. We pray for all women who have assumed the role in a child's life. Grant them joy and an appreciation of others. We pray for those who are grieving the loss of their mother in the past year. Grant them comfort and hope. Lord, we thank you for the gift of motherhood in our lives. Bless the mothers among us on this special day. We ask for these things in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join our hearts together in a prayer of confession to the Lord. O God, who loved us into being, we praise you. When we fall, you lift us up. When we fail, you restore us. When we confess our sins, you forgive us. Show us the magnitude of your love and grace, even now as we silently bow before you.
Lord, the prophet Isaiah, you put the words in his mouth that said, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. We give you thanks for your generous forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. So I failed to print in the bulletin the fact that I would do a children's message, which is basically this morning, just simply to uh, tell a, a Bible story. And so um, it's about a man named Noah. He was the only man on the face of the earth, and there might have been millions or billions of people on the earth at the time. He was the only one that was worshiping the Lord God. And uh, the Lord decided that uh, it was time for the human race to have a new start, that he would uh, judge the entire world, and that uh, he would spare Noah and his family, and from them he would repopulate the earth. Well, I mean, God gave Noah a very strange command. And that command was to build this enormous ark. Uh, I, I forget the exact dimensions of it, but it was huge. And uh, God gave him very specific instructions on how to go about constructing it. But it must have taken him a long, long time to build this ark. This was not, you know, something that... Uh, was up and running in a week. It, it may have taken 50 years. It, it may have taken 100 years. Uh, we don't exactly know. All we know is that Noah had a word from God that God was going to flood the earth and that he was to obey God by building an ark. And he was doing this on, on plain ground, like, like almost building this ark like in a place like Boylston where you know we were far away from a... Uh, well, not far away from a significant body of water, but, you know, he was building it on dry land. And uh, people would come and they'd say, you know, what in the world is this all about? I mean, this is craziness. And uh, Noah would just say that the Lord said uh, that he is going to flood the earth. And the Bible calls him a, uh, a preacher of righteousness. And he uh, encouraged other people to follow him in his pursuit of God. But the people ignored him. And the only evidence that uh, he had that something was going to happen was that uh, God said it. Uh, there were no meteorologists predicting a, a universal flood. There, were no, um, there was no way to foresee this thing. Uh, there was nothing that um, you know, uh, collaborated with what God had told him. But he um, nevertheless obeyed the word of God, built the ark, and then sure enough, there was the crack of thunder one day and rain for 40 days and 40 nights, and they spent a year in that ark, and the human race was destroyed, and out of it emerged Noah, his three sons, and their wives, and those eight people uh, repopulated uh, the earth. But again, the important thing for us today uh, that's consistent with the message that I'm going to deliver today is the fact that he had nothing to hold on to except the word of God, no collaborating evidence, but he took God's word to be a spiritual reality. He trusted it, and he was blessed as a result. And Lord, there are many things that we, uh, don't, we don't have all the answers to. We trust you sometimes just taking you at your word, not understanding how things are going to uh, happen, having very little evidence sometimes that you're moving in the direction you say you are. Uh, sometimes there's, there's absolutely no evidence. Uh, but help us, Lord, to trust your word and to believe in the spiritual realities that you have revealed therein. Uh, we pray this for all of our young people as they grow up, that they'll adopt this into their worldview, but really that each of us will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so at this time, we open the floor for uh, anyone that uh, has a prayer concern that they bring with them today or uh, a note of praise that you bring with you. Yes, Robert. Oh, 
Oh, good. That is good news. Yes, Marcia. Yeah, 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 I, I do, but... No. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I figured someone would mention it. And by the way, as I say all the time, I'd rather have, uh, uh, I'd rather hear things 10 times than zero. So don't ever worry about... Uh, uh, does he know or doesn't he know? Don't take that guess, just tell me. But uh, yeah, no, uh, she uh, was in her third trimester and gave birth to a stillborn. So uh, yeah, the family's gonna need a lot of prayer. Yeah, thank you, Marcia. All right, well, let's take April and, and many other concerns uh, to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you today uh, thankful that uh, in a sense you are like a mother. Uh, you uh, said through the prophet Isaiah, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But uh, even if that were possible, I could not forget you. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, that you uh, love us that much. And um, we are thankful for the good news that Bob brings today regarding his sister, and we want to pause to, to give you thanks. We do pray for um, uh, concerns that are on our hearts, and uh, yes, many of us are concerned for April and Sean, uh, for Trinity and Hope, as uh, the family has been hit with very difficult news this week, and we pray that you, the God of all comfort, would just meet this family in a most powerful way especially for April, who has invested so much into this pregnancy, Lord. Uh, be with this family, we pray. We pray for uh, uh, Sailor's uh, Aunt Missy, who is uh, uh, dealing with brain cancer. And we pray, Father, that you would be with the uh, surgeons, that are uh, the medical people that are tending to her needs, and we do pray for uh, a good outcome uh, in this case. Father, we pray for um, the house next door to the church, practically, where this morning there were ambulances, and we don't know what uh, uh, happened, how serious something might have been, but we ask for your intervention in that situation. And we pray for Karen Wagner, who was supposed to be with us today as our worship leader, as is printed in the bulletin, but uh, she's dealing with a bad case of vertigo, and we pray that you will bring healing to her. We continue to pray for our church, thankful for the congregational conversations that we've had, the understandings that we've come to, for the uh, tr transition team now, as they take all these materials and come up with final proposals. We do pray that uh, you would bless in the ratification process, that there would yet be the changes that would be necessary to give this church a thriving future. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for the right pastor to come along, that this pastor will be one who just deeply loves people, loves the sheep uh, in this flock, one who knows your word, loves your word, obeys your word, teaches your word, and we pray for one Lord that will um, lead us in the direction that we sense that you want us to go as we've uh, uh, come up with under our vision and direction statement. And so Lord, continue to uh, lead us, uh, we do pray, and we pray all these things today in Jesus' name, amen. Scripture readings for today. First scripture reading is from Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 14. 
When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, be careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering, and do not let your people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. But you must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you are about to displace consult sorcerers and fortune tellers, but the Lord your God forbids you to do such things. Second scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in, old, in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Though Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. And it was by faith that even <coughs> Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and she was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise and so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. May God bless the reading and the hearing of these verses. In recent weeks, I've talked about understanding the Bible, applying the Bible, obeying the Bible, and today we're talking about believing the Bible, believing the scriptures. And I'd like to start with Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. I can't see, so uh, do we have that up there? <laughs> we we got to coordinate this thing. Uh, uh, so Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 which says that all things were created by Jesus Christ, things in heaven and on earth, listen now, visible and invisible. It is fundamental to a Christian worldview that we believe that the universe 
consists of visible and invisible components. Uh, the, um, uh, there, there is more to the universe than meets the eye, as the saying goes. And if you think about it worldwide, um, there, there's just very few, very small percentage of people who are purely naturalistic. Uh, almost everybody in the world sees a spiritual dimension, something other than the material that we can see uh, as part of the universe. But how can we learn about the invisible realities in the universe? There is a, a right way and there is a wrong way, and I have a slide for that wrong way. Uh, the wrong way is to engage in these practices that we just read about in our scripture that are forbidden by God, that he considers to be an abomination. Uh, a small list of those would be things like astrology, charms, where you kind of feel like there's spiritual powers uh, involved in different uh, tangible objects, uh, maybe uh, crystals or maybe a rabbit's foot or something like that. Uh, there's divination, which is trying to uh, discern the future. Uh, that might be palm reading, tarot cards, crystal ball kind of stuff. Uh, there's sorcery and witchcraft, which is trying to uh, manipulate reality, move things uh, usually in the direction of blessing or usually in the direction of cursing, but you're trying to move reality uh, in an individual's life or in the life of a family or in the life of a, uh, a nation or a group or whatever. Uh, and then there's uh, contacting the dead, uh, like in seances and so forth, which is forbidden. And so uh, I could probably show you 50 to 100 verses. Uh, I looked up a bunch of verses this week. Um, and there were just too many to, to quote, you know, but I could probably show you 50 to 100 verses. So what I did was I took that scripture reading, which mentions quite a number of things, where there shall not be among you those who practice divination or tell fortunes or interpret omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a median or a necromancer, I don't know how to pronounce that, or one who uh, inquires uh, of the dead um, whoever does these things uh, is an abomination to the Lord. So those are some of the wrong ways that we can become familiar with the intangible elements uh, of the universe, at least as the, the Bible describes. Uh, the way that uh, we are to, the right way to become involved in um, uh, aware of spiritual realities is, is by the scriptures. And, um, and so, uh, you know, in the scriptures we read about God, right? And God's invisible. Nobody has ever seen God. That's an intangible, he's an intangible reality. All of his attributes and his characteristics are uh, intangible realities. His involvement in the world is kind of behind the scenes and it's an intangible uh, element. There's angels and Satan and demons uh, that are said to be involved in our lives. There's a, a power within us that we call sin uh, or the flesh. Um, and uh, and we, we sin against God and we need forgiveness. Well, it's not like a, uh, you know, a, a certificate comes down from heaven saying you've been forgiven. We, we know of these spiritual realities by the revelation that God has given to us. Um, God's acceptance of us, our reconciliation to God. The uh, uh, second coming of Christ is not something that we have tangible evidence of, but it will take place, as will the resurrection, the judgment, eternal life, heavenly rewards, heaven and hell, and a hundred other invisible realities that the only way that we know of these realities is because God has revealed them in his word. And it's very important that we understand that these are not mere metaphors. Uh, sometimes we say, you know, oh, he's dealing with his demons. Uh, but, and that's okay, that's a good analogy, but we don't want to uh, use that kind of thinking, of metaphorical thinking, to think that there isn't such a thing as uh, demons that are involved in the world. 
Um, or we might say, well, we make our own hell, but we don't want to take that to the point that we don't believe that there is such a place uh, as hell, etc. Now, what, what faith is, faith is believing that these spiritual realities are just as real as the material realities that we see around us. It's kind of like a, a, a spectrum, if you will. Uh, maybe at the one end of the continuum, there's the idea that the world is totally naturalistic. It's totally physical. It's totally cause and effect, and that there aren't spiritual dimensions involved in that. And again, it's a very small number of people that uh, truly believe that. Then there is, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, there is the idea that I just expressed, that the spiritual realities of which God speaks are just as real as the material realities that we see with our five senses and so forth. But then in the middle, there is the, uh, uh, the, that which seems to be quite common among us, and that is this nebulous thing. Rather than seeing uh, the universe as being binary uh, in the way that the, the Bible describes it, that there's things that are not real and things that are real, uh, it's like we create this third category, which I, I call nebulous faith, uh, where, you know, I, I, spiritual things are real, but they're just not as real as the things that we can uh, sense with our five senses and so forth. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse uh, 1, it says that uh, faith is being certain of things we do not see. Uh, and um, in other words, that uh, these spiritual realities are, you know, certain. They're, they're, they're real. They're real, real. And um, if you look at Hebrews 11.1, 1, which we just read, in the context uh, of the scripture reading that we read, um, what it's saying is that the things of which God speaks are just as real as the material things, that that is just as good of evidence as our own senses uh, provide us with, with uh, tangible things. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 says that uh, we live by faith faith and not by sight. In other words, we don't just live based on our five senses. We live also on faith that what God has revealed in his word is absolutely true. And so God wants us to take the uh, invisible realities of life and the visible realities of life and to merge them together in our minds as far as our outlook on life and uh, so forth. So um, we live every day with the reality that God really exists and that we exist for his purposes since he created us for his purposes. We believe that there's a God who is holy and righteous in all his dealings, present everywhere, all-knowing, good, loving, full of mercy, grace, forgiving, compassionate, sovereign, all-powerful, all-understanding, faithful to his self and to his word and his promises, uh, unchanging and, and so forth, that this, this is the God to whom we are relating, um, that we live every day with the reality that we have an enemy in Satan and demons. Um, as it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, you know, that we have an enemy, an adversary who lurks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy. Um, we have the reality that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. We have the reality that there are sinful tendencies within us. We live with the reality that God forgives us. We live with the reality that the Holy Spirit indwells those who truly believe in Christ and that he is working in their lives in order to make them more and more like Jesus. And we could go on and on and on with these spiritual realities uh, incorporating them into our lives. In a full Christian worldview, uh, we have these 
uh, visible and invisible realities uh, woven together uh, in the way that we look at the world. And I suspect that uh, all of us fall to some degree short of being the uh, people that uh, God wants us to uh, be in that uh, because um, faith is uh, a growth issue. It's an area not that we were ever perfected, but that we're constantly growing in, so that we're growing in our ability to see the invisible realities of which God speaks as being just as real as the things that we uh, have with our five senses. And so, um, you know, there's uh, someone that came up to Jesus one time, and Jesus said, do you believe? And uh, the person said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And that often describes my condition, and I just have a feeling it probably describes most people's condition. That, yeah, I believe, but you know, there's still room for uh, growth in my faith. Uh, faith is like a muscle that uh, you know, uh, gets developed and that we uh, grow with uh, over time. So faith is a virtue that God wants each of us to be growing in. Now, in Hebrews 11.2, we read, by, indeed, by faith, our spiritual ancestors received God's approval. And if we were to keep on reading through Hebrews 11, there would be person after person after person who had no tangible evidence that God was going to do what he said he was going to do, but they, they believed the word of God. That was the evidence for them. And they were uh, honored in this chapter, which many people have called the Hall of Faith. Um, but we talk, first of all, about a guy named Noah. Uh, Noah, you know, I mentioned him, right? He had no evidence that God was going to flood the world. There was no meteorologist telling him, you better get ready for this. Um, this was something that uh, he just took uh, God at his word and was commended uh, for his faith. But a story that I'll share as part of the message is that of Abraham, and that's the next slide. Um, you'll remember that uh, God told Abraham that I am going to make your descendants into a numerous and great nation. And so here he was, an old man at about, uh, oh, I forget how old he was at the time, but, but I mean, he was old and, um, you know, and there was no baby coming along. He and Sarah weren't conceiving and, um, you know, he was still trusting God, that God was going to fulfill his promise. But then they actually went beyond the stage of uh, where, you know, normally you would uh, be able to have a child. Uh, and so, uh, but they were able to supernaturally uh, conceive. And finally, after 25 years of having no evidence of a child coming along except a word from God, Finally, a child by the name of Isaac, that they gave the name Isaac, was born. And, uh, uh, of course, they were extremely pleased about this. And then, uh, like, uh, 12 or 13 years go by, and God issues a very strange command to Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to take your child, and I want you to um, go up to the top of Mount Moriah, I want you to subdue him, and I want you to sacrifice him to me as if you were sacrificing an animal sacrifice. Now here they had waited all those years for that pregnancy. Here the child had grown up for 12 years, and now uh, Abraham is being told to sacrifice this child. Well, it was a test of faith on the part of God. Abraham obeyed. Um, as it said in our scripture reading, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead, and figuratively speaking, uh, he did sort of raise Isaac uh, uh, back from the dead. Uh, and so, um, you know, again, no evidence that God was going to fulfill his plan in a very slow start in, you know, creating many descendants, but Abraham just believed God that it was going to happen. He's commended in there. He's considered the father of faith. He's in we're encouraged in scripture to have faith like Abraham had. Well, let me share just a few uh, examples of, uh, you can go to the next slide, Tom, a few examples of the way that, you know, this kind of works uh, 
in my life, but I'm, I'm not doing this so that you know how it works in my life. I'm doing this so I can trigger things in your minds of ways that it is working or can work uh, in your life. Uh, take me being an intentional intramister. minister. Um, I don't know if you can imagine this, but every church is different. Every church has a unique set of issues and problems. Every church has, you know, landmines that you got to be careful not to step on, you know. Um, and every church has personalities in it. And so, you know, um, quite honestly, I don't feel like I have everything up here. Although, you know, you might consider me seasoned and, you know, you know kind of like been around the block a few times. I don't have everything up here that every church needs. But I know who does. And uh, there's a scripture here that if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe. He must have faith and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Uh, and so, you know, and now you can go to the slide that was before this one. Um, uh, originally, I was going to be doing this, but Tom volunteered, and I kind of like it, and I'll, I'll, re I'll rearrange things in the future here so we can do this more smoothly. Um, but so, in other words, and I don't think any of you have all the wisdom that we need to know how God wants us to have a, uh, a thriving church. Uh, and so we can look to the Lord uh, on the basis of his promise for that wisdom. Uh, so we're dealing with real life situations here, but we can bring in that spiritual component uh, of God-given wisdom. But let me be a little shorter with a few more examples. Um, the news really gets to me. Uh, I don't care if I'm watching Fox, CNN, MS, NBC. It, it doesn't matter what the source is. The news agitates me because there's so much going on in the world that is just so wrong. And, um, and I get this magazine, too, that summarizes uh, the previous week's news. And it tells me about things going on in the world that we never hear about in our media. And you know what? It could get kind of depressing. But it doesn't. Because the Bible says God is the sovereign ruler and that he is steering the course of human history so that in the end, he receives glory and his people receive blessing. And so I hold on to that. That's a, I got the visible reality of the news and the invisible reality of the fact that God is sovereign and they're merged together. Or take, um, you know, a really bad time in your life uh, where, you know, it's hard to think of other than the bad thing that's happening to you. But then we remind ourselves that uh, the Bible says that uh, God's mercies are new every morning and that there are a lot of blessings taking place in my life even when, you know, there's a lot of bad things taking place in my life. And so that's a merging of bad realities with uh, the promises uh, of God. And one more, facing death. You know, this pandemic is not fun, and so many people have died. And um, it made us all think about illness. It made us all think about the possibility of death. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, we can trust God with the nature and the timing of our death. The Bible says that our times are in his hands, and we're not going to go before he is ready for us to go, before his appointed uh, hour for us. And so in that sense, we're not vulnerable. But, you know, yes, we, we, we don't want to, we love our families. 
We love our lives. There's so many things in this world that we love, but we don't want to forget that there are so many things that we have to look forward to as believers in Christ, and that there's a, a life to come that is going to be so superior to this that we won't miss it once we step over that threshold, a place where there's no more sickness or sin or death or mourning or crying, but a place where God wipes the tears away from our eyes and we dwell in his presence in a, in a, a sinless, pure uh, place forever and ever. And so, you see, we can take those visible realities of life that we're dealing with and we can merge them with the spiritual realities of which the Bible speaks, and that's called faith. That's what the Bible means by faith. So we close with this question, how integrated are the invisible and the visible elements of your life in your, uh, in your, in your life? And um, how much uh, faith do you have, and is there room for growth? So Heavenly Father, we just pray that you will uh, be with us as we all walk through this life, this life in which we have to uh, trust so many things that you have said within your word. But we do pray that there will be a convergence of spiritual realities and the invisible realities of which you speak that will carry us through each and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. sat down next to a woman on an airplane and asked the question that men always seem to ask. He said, so what do you do? And she replied, I'm transforming two homo sapiens into creatures that have a worldview that will help them transform the world for Jesus Christ. What do you do? He said, oh, I just practice law. So a happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers. May you be blessed today and wherever you're at in, in life and with motherhood and the whole issue of motherhood. And for all of us, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen.